Washington and focused on two, two things, two important things to cover today. First, we're going to um, hear briefly from some of the most um, active, engaged energy committee leaders across the state. As you've heard me say probably before, there are over 120 of these all-volunteer grassroots groups that have been working, many of them, for over a decade um, in their communities on climate and clean energy. Um, so there's a handful of them here. Help yourself to pizza, few people. Um, and the goal was just to have them say a few words about what they're doing, um, knowing that um, good public policy undergirds their efforts to succeed um, and their partners in getting to 90 by 2050. So we've done a lot here. There's a lot more to do. Um, and these local leaders and communities are partners with you in that. And so the goal is just to give you um, in the next 20, 25 minutes, so please, uh, Energy Committee folks, be brief, um, just an overview of what you're up to and what, you know, we'd like to partner with the legislature to see happen. So, starting first, not to put you on the spot, but maybe Kate. All right, Kate Stevenson, batter up, from Montpelier. Finish my fight. Um, so I'm Kate Stevenson. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Uh, we have a very active energy committee here in, in town. Um, and we've been working on a, a variety of initiatives, both public outreach uh, to the community and in the, within the municipality. Um, my focus has been on a lot of the municipal buildings and operations. Um, so you might have heard about some of our recent projects, the district heat um, coming into downtown, one megawatt of solar for city buildings and, and school district. Um, and we recently launched a revolving loan fund um, that will help us fund small energy efficiency projects. So we've been going through all the buildings and identifying projects um, that we want to take on that will save taxpayers money um, on their energy bills. And yeah, really appreciate um, all of the partnership that we have with Efficiency Vermont. They've been a huge resource to us. Um, in kind of tracking all of our work and, and identifying priorities. Um, you might have heard we, we won, we we're one of 10 finalists in the country um, for the Georgetown University Energy Prize this year. And a lot of that um, work was, was in collaboration with the folks at Efficiency Vermont. So, thanks. Anyone else? Duncan, take it away. Sorry, mid <laughs> I'm Duncan McDougall from Waterbury, and I'm with Waterbury Lake. We're an energy committee that's been running for 12 years. Uh, we've been quite active. Just to give you an, a few examples of what we do, uh, two weeks ago we had our 12th annual LEAP Energy Fair. It's grown into the largest energy fair in the state of Vermont. We have usually between six and 700 people come to the fair. We have more than 75 exhibitors to give you a sense of the range of the energy uh, economy here in Vermont. Uh, and one thing that really stands out is that um, people come not to save the environment, but they come to save money and save energy. And there's a, really a growing need for that. People want to have the expertise. They want to get their questions answered. They want to know how to move forward. And a lot of the incentives and uh, the programs that are generated at this building really make a big difference. They help people take the step to move forward. And the kind of savings that we generate through bringing those experts together with the people that, that need to save money and save energy, those are savings that last for decades. So it's not a one-time thing. It just if you weatherize your home, if you change your vehicle, et cetera, those go on for a long time. Uh, we, we support um, uh, training for heat pumps, weatherization. Um, we're probably going to do an electric vehicle rodeo in our town so people can learn about electric vehicles. Um, but the bottom line is that the, the steps that you guys take really make a difference. And uh, there are 120 town energy committees. And if your town doesn't have one, Talk to Joey from BNRC. Um, it really makes a big difference and helps every town that we're in. Thank you. Thank you. Linda? Um, uh, my name is Linda Gray, and I'm from the town of Norwich. And our energy committee has been around, I think, since 2002. So we've done, um, oh, we've done um, a variety of different things, working with residents on uh, weatherization and solar. We've done the those numbers of years in a row, and so we've accomplished a lot because we have about 20% of our residents having gone solar either on site or off site. Um, we've worked with the town, the town, and the elementary school and our library all have a power purchase agreement so that their electricity 
is solar. Uh, they didn't have to make the investment, they're just purchasing the power. Um, we are in the midst of doing enhanced energy planning, uh, the process outlined from Act 174, and I want to tell you guys, I think that is an excellent process, um, and it's, it's having us um, have a better, broader understanding of where we are right now and where we need to go. Um, something that it, it's, uh, is also raised one of the elements of it is to figure out within your town boundaries how much renewable energy generation should be you be aiming for, should you plan to have uh, develop in your town. And something that that's highlighted for me is some concerns relating to the current rules and potentially the new rules coming out for net metering. Um, because over the last under the current net metering rules, solar development has gone down a lot. That's a concern because if we're going to try to meet our goals, and if if net metering gets off the table, that that's going to be um, very tricky. So I'll just leave it at that, with that concern for you to look out for. Thank you. Steve Meyer from Middlebury. Um, we serve on the Town Energy Committee. Um, We've been active for about eight or nine years, I think. Um, what I'd like to talk with you about, you'll hear more about Town Energy Committee, you already have, and you'll hear some more from other folks. Middlebury is also engaged with a program called the Climate Economy Model Communities Program. It's a program of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. We were the second town chosen. They're now are rolling it out in Randolph, and I can expect to continue to do that, uh, two or three of those per year community organizing process that you may be familiar with that BCRD does broadly across a number of different topics. And uh, so we were able to bring together over 150 community members and leaders within the community to focus on the question of how do we begin to think about what a community looks like, how is it structured, how do we um, make it a uh, or continue to make it, improve it as a place to live, as a place to work, as a place to, to raise your family and, uh, and, and stay engaged in community life as we uh, transition from our current economy to a new post-carbon economy. We're already, as a, as a world, as a community and everything in between, we're already in the process of, of that transition. And uh, we have choices to make about whether we're just going to get plowed over by it uh, and the forces at work, or whether we actually choose to engage and try to be on the leading, leading front of some of these things so that both as communities and as a state we might position ourselves uh, favorably uh, in a, a regional, national, and international economy. So uh, thank you for all the work that you do. I guess the last thing that I'd say, uh, having uh, spent some time in this building over the years, and around politics is that I think the, the public may well be ahead of where folks are in this building on this issue. And uh, uh, that's happened before, it will happen again. And I encourage you to, to uh, uh, engage uh, with that in mind and, and really start to take even bolder actions than the ones we've been able to take as a state so far. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that was following up on what Steve said, and, uh, that you pointed out that sometimes uh, town energy groups are uh, certainly ahead of what we're doing in this building. Um, and the woman from Montpelier mentioned that uh, her great work with Efficiency Vermont. It seems like every year we are protecting uh, that um, their funding so that they continue to do the good work that they um, that they do. There's always somebody in this building who's trying to cap them or whatever. Um, um, and I think we all need to realize that we'd all be paying more for electricity. So when you have good um, experiences, and you could really like spread it online, mm -hmm. that would be helpful to us in Saudi Arabia. Okay. Good Excuse me, Marcy Murray with the South Mountain Energy Committee. The city started our committee about 10 years ago. And two of our recent projects uh, include the uh, 2.1 megawatt solar landfill project that over the next 25 years should save taxpayers two to five million dollars. Secondly was a, a collaborative project we did for the two-year energy prize and our 
residents are now enjoying $750,000 in savings on annually on gas and electric bills because of that. Our accomplishments really build on things that you accomplish here, your programs and policies, and we also rely heavily on the um, expertise, services, and um, incentives through the energy efficiency utility um, offered through Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas. So those are very helpful. Currently, we are focused on um, local, uh, reducing uh, emissions and local and regional transportation, as well as working with our city staff to help them meet their commitments to the Vermont, Vermont Climate Pledge Coalition. Uh, pledge their commitments. Um, so I'm here representing uh, unofficially uh, my committee, our committee. People gave me input, but I'm also here as a mom. Um, and I'm alarmed at what is <clears throat> happening on the federal level right now in terms of the misinformation that's out there, climate, peer-reviewed climate science being ignored, and sound economic analysis being ignored. So it's just, I'm very thankful for the progress that you have supported because we really need strong leadership in our state right now to pick up, help the state pick up the pace to do, take substantive action uh, to address climate change. Otherwise, future generations, our kids, um, their descendants are going to run into a world that has environmental and political instability that I think is hard to imagine right now. So again, thank you for what you're doing. We're very um, encouraged by the um, climate package that seems to be going forward today, this week. Um, in particular, the decarbonization study, I think is very useful in terms of, especially folks who have some um, uh, doubts about, oh, can this really help? I think it's really helpful to, to give that money to study um, different carbon pricing um, policies and cap and trade policies, whether it's through um, the um, Western Initiative, Climate Initiative with California, Quebec, and um, uh, Ontario, uh, and the other ones. So again, very important, and also happy to hear that it sounds like the $500,000 will be returned to, will not be taken out of the Clean Energy Development Fund. So these are just things that we really need to look at for bold action, and thank you very much for the work that you're putting into that. It's, it, I think, will make a difference. Laurel Stevenson from Portland. Uh, I'm a new Energy Committee member. Um, uh, our Energy Committee has been around for, I think, about 10 years. Uh, we're down to two people, and in the last few months, uh, we're up to eight people. I think a lot of people are really getting active, coming together. I, I hope that we can together address this problem. I know for me, I have family in uh, the West Coast, and I used to take piano lessons in Montecito. And the, the 20 deaths there um, really hit close to home for me, to my old home. Um, we're already paying the price for not taking action. We're not going to be able to afford what it's going to cost unless we somebody steps up and and take leadership. And I think Vermont is in a position that we can do that. Although the, the West Coast is in some ways ahead of us at this point. Um, I'm on the energy on the energy committee. I've taken this transportation on as my topic, and so I have um, interest in making sure that uh, and since transportation is actually the biggest um, user of energy in Vermont at this point, I have to of energy um, to help electrification roll out as quickly as possible. Is certainly on my personal agenda on the energy committee, uh, getting charging stations out there so that people don't feel, in California, I know my um, my brother doesn't want to get an electric vehicle because he says so when he rode in somebody else's, they had to wait in line for the um, <clears throat> for the charge. And we don't want to, when, when 
this wave sweeps across Vermont, we want to be ready for it so we don't run into glitches like that. Um, also, I'm on the, I'm not a physician myself, but I'm on the uh, Physicians for responsibility, Social Responsibility mailing list. And it's mind-boggling the health costs of uh, uh, not addressing this problem. Um, I, I think that's all I have to say as a new member, but thank you. Thank you. And knowing we have very limited time, Alan and uh, then Chuck. Oh boy. Um, okay, so uh, <laughs> Alan Johnson, I was a uh, founding member of the Harvard Energy Commission some uh, 10 years, 11 years ago. I was the chair. <laughs> Uh, for eight years or so until I was demoted to liaison and I was elected to the select board. So now I'm two years into a select board position, uh, three years seat. And um, I just wanted to share, you know, our, our, our biggest challenge at the municipal level is the 500, uh, 500 kilowatt net metering cap because we were one and a half times over that limit before the rules went into effect. And it's pretty clear that, that something needs to be done. To, 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 I understand the need for that rule, but I also understand that you know, preventing Harvard, the town of Harvard, the ninth largest town of Vermont, from proceeding with our renewable rollout on, when we're on Green Mountain Power is created, which is not hurting and can take all the renewables we can throw at it, that, that we're, we're an unintended consequence of that rule. So some adjustments around those net metering rules are clearly called for. And then further, some support for the utilities that the net metering rule was put in place to allow them to transition to a grid infrastructure like Green Mountain Power and so many other utilities in Vermont have so that they can manage these, renewal, these distributed renewable resources, which is how the market's moving anyways. Um, those are really important things, I think, uh, at the management level. We, um, I want to share our biggest success. Uh, it got so many great things going on, but clearly the outstanding success we've had in the last year is the hiring of Vermont's first full-time energy coordinator as a staff position. And uh, we did that with the expectation and hope that within three or five years that his position would pay for itself and we'd start to see some returns. I found out on Tuesday night the town manager reported that his work has already covered its general fund costs and we are now seeing returns seven months into the position. So um, getting those resources for Hartford, ninth largest town in Vermont, million plus dollars on energy between the town and the schools, about fifty million dollars as a community. It's easy for us to look at the numbers, and it took us five years of pulling teeth to get people to look at the numbers to make this decision and hire this position. Most towns in Vermont don't have that kind of uh, expense to manage. So getting resources like that at the regional planning level, uh, having teams of people in the regional planning commissions that can not just do strategic planning, which we've got a lot of great help for already, but can also manage projects and implement them and be boots on the grounds for the smaller towns where the select board people like me are actually out driving the public works trucks, which boggles my mind. You know, that's most of Vermont. So um, we need to support those folks too in this transition. And um, I'll just throw in too that, you know, this, this is, for me, you know, I've, I've been at this for over a decade and my understanding of the situation has morphed uh, pretty dramatically over the years. You know, I came into this with, you know, how do we make this transition happen? How do we make this transition happen? And that was the drive for almost 10 years. And then just this fall, we've come across some information um, about some market forces that are going to drive this transition for us, whether we like it or not. So there's automated vehicles coming, the cost of renewables and storage is dropping dramatically. So we've got 10, 15 years of energy disruption that's coming. And the first one is in transportation. So we're trying to shift a little bit more from how do we make this happen in the town living within our energy commission, from how do we make this transition happen to how do we manage this transition to make sure that our town and our state, hopefully it'll be the same, that our state can take advantage of these transitions and not be left behind and not leave our most vulnerable citizens behind uh, as so many technology disruptions have done over the years. So um, I really hope that we can start thinking about that. And on that note, you know, I have a lot of deep thoughts about, you know, was it still smart to hire an energy coordinator? Yeah, I did the math, it's still good. Even if energy costs go down, we still save money with an energy coordinator at the town level. But, um, you know, the question of, do you, do you have to ask yourself these questions? These are tough questions. Does it still make sense to put a price on carbon in Vermont? And more specifically, does it still make sense to put a price on fossil fuels in Vermont? And I've thought hard about this, and I absolutely believe it is, because fossil fuels now represents the single most vulnerable aspect of our economy in Vermont. So we need to get a price on it so that we can start funding programs to help not just individuals, definitely individuals, especially our low-income folks, but our um, industries as well transition off of the need for fossil fuels, including those that sell fossil fuels. You know, think about every gas station in Vermont. Most of them don't make a profit on the, on, on, on the gas that they sell. 
They, you know, they use the stores as their main source of profit, but there's a heck of a lot of expense around those things. So when they stop selling gasoline, that's going to have a major effect on our economy. So we have to manage that as well. So putting a price on it now before um, it goes away <laughs> so that we can fund this transition and do it right and manage land use issues, the list goes on. So that's what we're struggling in Hartford is trying to think about that stuff. And we'd love to help the state figure it out too. Thanks. Chuck, last brief word before they move on to a whole other really important presentation. Brief word, but I'm the most sorry. important. Oh, <laughs> I'm with the uh, Heinsberg Energy Committee, and chair that. Uh, I'll just tell you one effort we're doing presently, which is uh, coordinating with seven other energy committees in the Chittenden County area to put on a workshop series that is focused primarily on getting existing homes to net zero. Um, and that effort, <clears throat> we're very encouraged by what we're finding and some of the research that we've come up with, but essentially we're realizing that people do want this, they want to get their homes to net zero, and they can do it by, uh, first of all, for recommending, you know, weatherize your house, second, probably put something like a heat pump in there that's electrically based, and then third, supply the renewable energy. So those three things combined are what people are doing anyway. What we're finding is that no one's coordinating that activity. So we, we are actually going to piggyback with the program from a group in the state that has piloted a project called Zen, which is Zero Energy Now, that actually coordinates all that activity. We're also, at the present moment, looking at financing. So we talk about incentives really help because if you look at somebody's utility bills and then look at what it would cost to pay a mortgage to pay those things you just put in your house, they get pretty close. And if you have incentives and you have good financing or even a, a financing that's supplemented somehow via the state, those things make economic sense. And on top of that, then you're putting a lot of people to work doing those things. So it creates green jobs. So it's, for us, it seems like a win-win kind of situation. and. Um, It'll help us, I think, trans, trans, transition to a more sustainable energy economy. So, uh, we are doing our last four-part series. Happens Wednesday night, and we're looking at case studies. Actually, houses that have done this and have reduced their monthly income uh, by paying a mortgage instead of all their fuel bills. So, it will be online. We all our energy committees are going to have that on their website, and we'll make that available to you too. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for taking the time and sorry for um, being brief and abrupt. And we're going to pull out as you listen to another important focus, which we fully support. Um, but I think you've heard it like we can't do this without you and the partnership. So we'll be back. Sorry. So, uh, I don't know. What, 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 yeah, taking into account what you have in mind for the rest of the, the hour, well, I, I um, is there time for, for us to ask some questions? No, there are um, We've got the 350 people. I know, so how given taking that into account, if we have time for uh, maybe one question? Do you have a question? Okay, I, I, okay. Or I don't, can I ask it? Yeah. Well, I, I, now I don't have so much a question as I have um, a request from you. Um, many of you who spoke uh, come from towns that where your representative or your senator are sitting here in this room, and in many ways you're preaching to the choir. Um, but we have an election season coming up. And as Steve Meyer noted, um, there are times when uh, the, the elected officials in this building seem to act like they're maybe a little bit behind what public sentiment is. Um, so I would just encourage you to, as you enter election season, um, ask those questions of the candidates who are running um, and who will appear on your ballot. Ask them how they feel about uh, in increasing the incentives to help people transition away from fossil fuels. Ask them how they plan to vote on some of these issues that are coming up in the future. And, and make your decisions on who to support based on that and encourage other, uh, you know, other energy committee members who maybe aren't here today to also do that because it's important for the people to push um, because we know that the pushback that we get when we propose some of these things is going to be well funded, well coordinated, and loud. Uh, so we need you to be louder. <laughs> Thank you so much. We really Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Great. So I'd like to start by thanking the Climate Caucus for you know, existing in the first place and being bold and courageous enough to take on issues of climate change. I know it's not always an easy thing to do in the positions that you're in, but we're extremely appreciative that you're here. Uh, my name is Julie Masuga, and I've been in the battle against issues of climate justice with groups like Protect Your Prax Park and 350 Vermont for about two years now. And I spend a lot of time in public hearings and in meetings where I find myself in a sea of people from older generations. I spend a lot, and I listen to them speak with fear in their voices. They're afraid of what kind of planet they're leaving behind for their grandchildren. And as one of those grandchildren, I'm terrified and I ask myself the same thing every day. Our elected officials have to ask themselves these tough questions too. Will they find themselves in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry or will they join us in the struggle to make this planet livable for those they were elected to represent? Progress has been slow on this front, but we're getting somewhere. In 2012, fracking was banned in Vermont. However, it's still okay for us to import fracked fuel from across our borders via pipelines. This time last year, Vermont Gas completed their 41-mile ANGP pipeline, which is now under investigation for numerous alleged safety violations. 41 miles of reckless construction, all at the expense of the health and safety of people, our wildlife, and our climate not to mention ratepayers, as the cost of the project has nearly doubled. For these reasons and many more, we are asking for politicians that we have voted into office to consider bold legislation like H746, which calls for a ban on any new fossil fuel infrastructure in the state. 31 towns have signed on to, no, to, have to prevent new fossil fuel infrastructure from being built in their towns, but we need to do more. Bills like this would reduce greenhouse gas emissions, helping Vermont meet its emissions goals, and more importantly, help us curb the effects of climate change. At the same time, this bill would protect ratepayers from bearing the costs of new infrastructure. If you need a catchphrase, we can go green while saving some green at the same time. While we're saving money and protecting the climate in the long term, we can protect our beautiful state and its inhabitants in the short term from the ravages of construction that we've seen in our own backyards. We're here to say enough is enough. And I was going to say something about protecting our future, but as I heard last week, we're already in this. We're already at, we're past a breaking point. So we're here to say that we're, our future, as whatever that is um, in the wake of climate change, is not for sale to the fossil fuel industry. And today is an interesting day to be talking about this because perhaps as we speak, the head of the EPA is being questioned by Congress about <coughs> ethics violations. So it's clear we need to act on the state level if that's where we're at nationally. So we hope that you'll join us in trying to protect Vermont by preventing fossil fuel structure, infrastructure from prevailing. Thank you. So next we have Laura Simon. Hi, I'm Laura Simon from Hartford, Vermont. Um, I'm involved with a few environmental groups, uh, 350 Vermont is one of them, but these are my own comments. Um, in Vermont and in my town, Hartford, there are a lot of reasons that we must pass a bill like the one that Mary introduced, H746, no new fossil fuel bill. And Hartford residents have suffered from millions of dollars of damage from Hurricane Irene. And most scientists say that the crisis is caused by carbon and methane released into the atmosphere. Frack gas releases methane. I know you're saying we're preaching to the choir, that's true. So you probably already know these things, but evidence tells us we will experience this again, more disasters, and uh, whose homes will be destroyed the next time? How much more will we pay in town, state, and federal taxes for the next disaster? Mm -hmm. So there's a proposed fracked gas pipeline in the town of New Hampshire that borders my town, Hartford, um, it's Lebanon. Uh, and the Hartford residents, we have no say about it, even though our town is bordered by the White River and the uh, Connecticut River. So uh, we feel pretty vulnerable to what's happening there. Uh, and a bill like this could prevent that pipeline from being extended into our town. Um, as I think others will tell you, Vermont Gas um, is now the PUC. Vermont PUC has uh, to start an investigation because of their practices uh, and safety concerns. Um, companies like Vermont Gas and other pipeline companies, um, they either threaten or actually use eminent domain to take people's land. They do not listen to the wishes of the local residents. Um, and they pass their costs on to customers, as you know, uh, even though their budgets have doubled what was expected and approved. 
So we know, folks, that the feds are not going to take leadership on this. 350 Vermont, as you heard from Julie, um, had the resolutions in 31 towns. How many folks here have resolutions in your towns of legislators? Just three? Four, okay. Um, four towns. What's that? I represent four towns. Oh, and all four of them? <laughs> four exactly. Uh, uh, did all four of them have a resolution? Uh, certainly three did. I don't know, did, did Sharon have one? Sure, yeah. All four? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> All right. So I was just going to, um, the Shumlin had signed an agreement with the Global Climate Leadership um, that committed us to reductions in emissions up to 95% by 1990, and we're not meet, meeting those benchmarks. And I'm just going to quote a little bit about climate change presents worldwide challenges and risks to the environment and economies, impacting human health, increasing extreme weather events, and threatening natural resources. In this next legislative session, we must pass a bill like 746. Um, this is what the 31 towns that voted for the resolution, this is what they're asking of the legislature. Um, and we must do this uh, for the safety of our children and future generations. I think what we would like to hear after we do our presentation is what all of you feel uh, the next step is and what you're willing to commit to. We actually have a little sign-on sheet to see if you're willing to be a sponsor for this kind of legislation next session. And we're counting on you to take leadership to introduce and pass a no fossil fuel um, bill next legislative session. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm three. Oh. Yeah. I'm three. <laughs> Hi. I'm, I'm going to bring my chair because my knee's back. And also, I'm not, I'm not very comfortable speaking publicly, even though I may seem like it, so I could fall down. But uh, anyway, I'm a social worker. I'm a clinical social worker, and I'm licensed in Vermont. And I was listening to, and, I, and I've been meaning to talk with you guys, and, and I try to bring this perspective. Um, I've come to a couple of the caucuses in February, January, February, about that time, and then I slacked off. But, I have this perspective, um, and it, it, it speaks to something someone said earlier about how people are more um, willing to change than, than business is letting us do. And, and, and politicians, of course, have to really <coughs> balance that. Uh, and I appreciate what you guys do, but what I see, and I've worked in 21 schools or, or so in, in the Orange County area, I'm in private practice now, but I worked with um, Claire Martin Center and um, worked with mostly teenagers, mostly boys. But what the, the testimony that I bring from them is generally a sense of um, denial, but also a clear sense that they're, um, they're terrified, which is why there's denial. Now, I see boys who try to uh, uh, you know, bring some macho things to their world. That's what they think their identity is. Well, these kids are scared. And it's not just because they're teenagers, but because of what they face. And so the biggest thing is jobs, of course. But the second thing, I think, is the world around them. So war and the environment. But um, one kid I have who goes to Oxbow High School, he said that 97%, this was news to me, of his friends, um, not his friends, but the whole school body, know about climate change, global warming. They know what it is. They, and they're, they're, they're positively against it. So when I talk about what they bring to me in our sessions, and, and I could say I haven't collected the data and I haven't done a good job of really collecting the data, but I could, um, that uh, a large percentage of them are too afraid and too uh, unable to articulate the fear that they have. And so we're doing that, and you and the Climate Caucus are doing that. But this bill here is a counterbalance to the, the fear um, of actually stopping the infrastructure in its tracks. And um, like I said, I, I, I'm not a good speaker. I start to sort of get emotional. But if we don't stop the infrastructure in its tracks, there will be no opening for the, the green alternatives. It just can't happen. Um, and I know that you as legislators have to look at how that's going to transition, how it's going to work. Um, and I know my representatives are doing that, um, but it's not fast enough. And it's not fast enough for these kids. So that's why I'm here. And I, I felt I had to speak um, because these kids don't have a voice. 
Um, so I'd like to do some research. I come from a good research institution where I got my degree. And I, I need to do my work, but I'd like you guys to lead uh, and take the risk of supporting uh, this bill uh, to stop the infrastructure now and not later, because as we continue to invest, it'll become harder and harder to, you know, with the new pipelines to really create space for what we're, other things we're talking about. So that's it. I just wanted to bring their perspective. Yeah, thank you. I'm Jeffrey Gardner from Bradford, and I think, first of all, I'd like to thank Mary for introducing this bill in the House. I think that took enormous courage. We look at the national scene, almost everything official presses against what you've done, and I feel the same, actually, in our state as well. I was really impressed by all of the things that were said town by town here today, and I think our worry and what we would like to overcome with this bill is the creeping thought behind all of that, that all of that good work and all of the good work that could follow after it could be obviated by new fossil fuel infrastructure. We don't only have to decarbonize, we do have to do that. We also have to degasify. I know all of you know that Gas emissions as a greenhouse gas are 86 times more powerful over the short run, 10 to 20 years, than carbon. And that is something really serious to take into account when you also know that somewhere between 3 and 11 or 12 percent of the gas that is fracked from the wellhead all the way to where you turn your stove on leaks, and it's those emissions that are critical in all of this. Now, were this bill to pass, three things that are possible in the future would occur. One is this line here, extending the pipeline, Vermont gas pipeline, to Rutland would not be able to occur. It's on hold now. Why is it on hold? It's on hold because people have opposed it. I have not seen political opposition to it. It was wonderful last year when we came to this group and we had complaints about what was happening at DPS relative to a whole range of topics. We asked you to write them and ask them to ask the Public Utilities Commission to reconsider the Certificate of Public Good, and you did that. And the answer that you got was, we'll get back to you later. I suspect they never got back to you later, and I worry about that. This bill would make that impossible. Second of all, there was a pipeline, gas pipeline, proposed from upstate New York to run across northern Massachusetts and come into our state in Vernon, Massachusetts, in Vernon, Vermont. And the idea was that it was going to be a gas-fired electrical plant. And in some way, that sounds great, because we buy our gas to run our electrical system from other states. Well, is it so great? Probably not. We have to find other ways of doing things like that. That's not happening for now. Why is it not happening for now? Because Kinder Morgan now doesn't find that to be profitable. Will they find it to be profitable later? Probably. Because one thing to understand about this is that the pressure to get the stuff, oil and gas, out of the ground by fracking is so intense that what rules these days is a kind of gold rush mentality. And that has landed us in enormous problems, for example, in Addison County with the Addison National Gas Pipeline. So this is on hold. Something else that threatens is this black line. That black line is the portrait, Portland to Montreal oil pipeline, 76 years old. It brought gas from the port in Portland into Canada during the Second World War. 76 years old, carrying crude at that time. The goal here is to reverse the flow in that pipeline and bring tar sands dilbit, highly corrosive, through the Northeast Kingdom, across New Hampshire, and then down to Portland. The pipeline probably cannot take that. 
Who is thinking about that? People in Portland are thinking about it. They passed a law, a local ordinance, that would block their port being used. That now is in federal court. Why? Because the pipeline companies are claiming it's in restraint of interstate trade. If they lose, we've got a big problem to face there. If we had this bill, that would go by the boards too. Maybe not, because it would be crossing a state boundary. That puts it in the pocket of FERC to decide whether the project would be permitted or not. And FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has, until recently, approved just about everything. This bill that we're asking you to support can't really say no fossil fuel infrastructure here if this becomes part of a FERC proceeding. However, it does instruct the Department of Public Service in this state to oppose this pipeline or any other new fossil fuel infrastructure project under the jurisdiction of FERC. We're talking about big danger here. Not danger way in the future, hard to see, of, of uh, climate change, although those realities are becoming more and more present all the time. And that brings up the issue of accidents, safety concerns, public health concerns, right here in Addison County, where I think, in fact, you see right here in Vermont that gold rush mentality and the disregard that it imposes, both with respect to the public processes that are supposed to restrain that sort of thing, and also disregard for people, all in the name of a cheap fuel. Not so cheap when you consider all of the proceedings that have gone on that have cost the state lots of money. Not to speak of all the people who have opposed it, who have been arrested in opposing it, which is a further expense for the state, in Addison County, the reason that there now is a new proceeding at the Public Utilities Commission about the health and safety consequences of the way in which this pipeline was constructed is owing to a handful of people in the area of that pipeline spending months, this all began in the summer of 2016, gathering information through discovery process about how this pipeline was built, how it was inspected, how it was poorly built, and how it failed to be inspected properly. At this point, most of that evidence is documentary. We do have a photograph that you probably all have seen already of a pipeline buried 18 inches when it's supposed to be buried four feet. And further serious problems, a whole range of them. I invite all of you just to take a quick look through the products of the discovery process in this case and see what has occurred there. The extent of it, we don't really know. The really important thing, though, is this small group of people in Addison County have been doing the government's job. This is about how the Department of Public Service has not followed through on grave safety concerns. Their motive, I have my guesses, they're really not important. The fact of the matter is that a project of this type is huge relative to assets in Vermont. I don't see how, even with the best intentions, they could have properly overseen a, pro a, a project like this. That's why we need this legislation, and that's why I think what we'd like you to do is to let us know if you would be interested in signing on to work with us to get this passed, because it really is important in many, many ways. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, that uh, double bell is summoning for the Senate. Uh, yeah, so we're going to be moving quickly towards wrap. I, I, I want to say something I would ask of, of you folks, which is I tried to address this issue maybe 20 years ago at the local level and felt, my God, I live in a town of 2,000 people. What can we do? I'm going to run for the legislature. In the legislature, I have the feeling, my God, we're so remote from the people. We all really need to work together. 
And one of the things you folks can do right with feet on the ground in your hometowns is to not let your family and friends and neighbors off the hook when they, uh, pardon the expression, I don't say this to them because I don't want to insult people, but you and I know we hear a lot of bullshit, okay? And it's people who call themselves, quote, skeptics. And skepticism is holding off, holding out for better evidence, not ignoring the proof. Okay, there, it's not skepticism, it's, it's stubbornness. And we gotta not let people off the hook. There's the, also the idea of, of that, uh, well, there's always been a naturally occurring warming and cooling cycle on the planet. That's right, that's our baseline, that's how we know we've got a problem. Because we're deviating from that rhythm so so profoundly. With people in person, lots and lots of personal conversations multiplied you know, 630,000 times will, uh, will give us more support. The other thing is, Mary alluded to this, I'm, I'm sorry to be so, so practical, but uh, we got an election coming up. And you know, you need to put signs in your lawn as ugly and stupid as they are. And, uh, and ask the money. hard questions of every candidate, as Sarah yeah. said. Yeah. Okay. Folks, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be back next year. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.